I just want to welcome everybody here. My name is Patricia Fort. I manage the public programs and visitor services here at California Historical Society. Um, right now, you're in the middle of our exhibition, which is called Murales of Valdez, uh, LA Chicana and Chicano Murals Under Siege, which tells eight mural stories of uh, Chicano and Chicano murals that were whitewashed, censored, or destroyed. So we hope that you get to see the exhibition today or come back before September 16th when it closes. And it's been such a joy to create programming for this exhibition. We do between 50 to 60 public programs here and then also all across the state. So you can find us here, but also at other locations hosting discussions like this. So I'm really happy to have um, Professor Garcia here tonight. Um, when I had heard about the book and read it myself, I thought it was an amazing testament to um, research um, the, the knowledge that was built based on that research and then sharing the stories of um, these seminal Chicano leaders. So um, I think we're going to all learn a lot tonight, including myself. Um, Mario is a distinguished professor of Chicano studies at History of the University of California, Santa Barbara. He received his PhD at UC San Diego, a Guggenheim Fellow. He's the author of 20 books. And I could list all the books because they're all here right now and they're all amazing. Um, and I can, but you know, just know that he's a prolific author. Desert Immigrants, Memories of Chicano History, Louis Leal, An Autobiography, Blowout, The Latino Generation, Voices of New America, The Chicano Generation, which we'll be talking about tonight, The Gospel of Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta Reader, which he's the editors for. Um, and he has a new biography coming out of Friar uh, Luis Alviarez and the Sanctuary Movement in LA, which we published in 2018. So know that he's a prolific author, amazing scholar. We're so excited to have him tonight. Um, talk to him afterwards when you get your book signed about the work that he's working on. Um, and I'm just really honored to have him here. And I'm really glad that there's a conference that coincides with this program. So. Um, that he's able to join us tonight. So, and if you're in LA or in Santa Barbara, come see him there. Um, I'm sure he speaks quite prolifically as well. So I'm gonna hand it over to Mario. I'm gonna thank him so much. I thank all of you. Um, please grab me at the end of the program if you have any questions about the events that we do, topics you'd like us to talk about or have presented here. This is a really collaborative environment and I really welcome that. You also have your surveys. You can always list ideas for programming there as well and I, I take those very seriously. Um, so anyway, to Mario, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for being here. And I want to thank uh, Patty Fort and the California Historical Society for inviting me. So it's a pleasure and an honor to, uh, to be here. So, um, you know, I, um, have, as Patty mentioned, uh, worked on the area of Chicano Latino history for many, many years. And I, I, I guess I'm known to some degree for taking a generational approach to that history. So the main title of this book, uh, which came out in 20, 2015, is The Chicano Generation. But previous to that, I've worked on other historical generation that relates to Mexican-Americans in the United States. So um, I've dealt with what I call the immigrant generation in Chicano history, which is basically the first mass wave of Mexican immigrants that came to the United States between 1900 and 1930, over a million Mexican immigrants. Uh, in my family, on my mother's side, uh, they came in that period of time because some of them were coming as economic immigrants, but some were com coming as political refugees from the Mexican Revolution of 1910. And so I worked on that. Uh, but then I became curious also about what, would ha what happened to the children of uh, the immigrant generation. So I did a number of books on what I call the Mexican-American generation, which is the children of these immigrants for the most part. It's the so-called second generation experience. And these were uh, Mexican-Americans that were born in the United States. In fact, the term Mexican-American actually comes out of that period of the 1930s and 40s. And so I, I, I periodized the Mexican-American generation from 1930, at the beginning of the Great Depression, to 1960 or the early 60s before the Chicano generation. And this was a generation that wasn't well known, but it's, it's, a, but, uh, but it's an, a generation that actually was quite active. The Chicano generation tended to uh, not have a very good uh, admiration for the previous generation. 
they felt that a lot of the Mexican Americans prior to the Chicano generation were kind of like vendidos or sellouts. Uh, by the way, I didn't say buenas noches. Buenas noches, <laughs> good evening. Uh, they thought they were more sellouts and that they weren't involved at all, but in my studies I found quite the, op quite the opposite. A lot of Mexican Americans were involved in some of the initial uh, civil rights activities, uh, groups like LULAC, later after the war, the American GI Forum, uh, fighting against uh, school segregation, segregation in public facilities like restaurants and um, uh, other kinds of public facilities and also in terms of uh, just basic discrimination that Mexican Americans were facing at that time. And so, um, so I, I did a number of books on that period and then of course moving up to this, the Chicano movement and the Chicano generation, which is the subject of this, uh, of this book. It's important to, to, have, to know this history. I tell my students that there are two, at least two basic reasons why we, know, we need to know about the Chicano Latino experience in the United States. The first is a, is, is, is a demographic one. Um, many people don't realize the extent of the Chicano Latino population, which is getting close to about 60 million people. That's larger than many countries in the world. And so uh, it's the largest minority in the United States. Uh, and it's projected by 2050 that uh, at least uh, one third uh, of all Americans will be of Latino background. Not only Mexican Americans, but uh, people of Central American, Puerto Rican background and so forth. So just demographically, it's important to know about the Chicano Latino experience because otherwise, we fall into thinking that it's a relatively new experience, or even worse, we, we fall into the stereotyping. And that's really important now because we've, we've, we continue to hear about those stereotypes. And unfortunately, the present administration is perpetuating a lot of those uh, stereotypes of criminality, of uh, people who are just here to take things away from other Americans, all of which is not true. And it gives people a sense that, you know, that uh, these are people that have not contributed very much to this country. And yet, Chicanos and Latinos have been very much a part of American history. They are American history. I mean, you can go back to the Spanish colonial conquest from Texas to California. And, and so, to, to trace that experience. And so, I tell my students as well, you know, where do you think cities' names like San Francisco and Los Angeles and Santa Barbara, or El Paso, where I was born and from, where did those names come from? You know, they didn't come from the Mayflower, did they? They came up from another source, from another historical uh, experience. And um, then you can, you know, move up uh, the historical period of time, you know, the settlements that were here from Cal Texas to California and how they were taken in the 1840s by the United States in the mid-1840s the so-called U.S.-Mexico War, a war of conquest, a war of choice, a war of aggression. Um, and so overnight, in 1848, you have a new grouping of Americans that we can call, the, I mean, in some ways, the first generation of Mexican-Americans. But I call them the conquered generation to carry out my generational uh, discussion. Because conquest, for those period, those people after 1848, was the main experience that they face, and then we move up immigrant generation, Mexican American, and the Chicano generation. In fact, I even have a book now published a few years ago based on interviews with some of my students that I call the Latino generation, the millennials, Latino style. And so that's the kind of uh, approach that I've taken to Chicano Latino history, but it's, it's also, uh, you know, to emphasize that Chicanos and Latinos have been very much a part of this country. They've given, you know, those, that immigrant generation that came in the early 20th century, they gave their blood sweat and tears for this country. They, they worked and they worked and they worked. They worked in the fields, they worked in the mines, they worked on the railroads, they worked in construction, they worked in urban industries and services, women as domestics, women in the laundries. My own aunt worked in, for many, many years in the old El Paso laundry right along the border for many years. Uh, and so they, they gave a lot and helped to create the wealth of this country. They didn't benefit a lot from that wealth, but they certainly created a lot of that wealth. And, uh, and that's important because some Americans still think that uh, Latinos are the last of the immigrants. Like they just came literally last night, but they've been coming in mass waves, as I mentioned, since the early 20th century. And then as I mentioned, 
that Mexican American generation fought for civil rights, and uh, you know uh, they they are part of civil rights history, and that knowledge uh, suggests that we can no longer just simply talk about civil rights in terms of a black-white um, history. It has to include other groups like Mexican Americans, Latinos who have fought for civil rights. In 1946, as some of you know, uh, Mexican Americans in Orange County uh, made a huge breakthrough uh, when the federal district court ruled that the segregation of Mexican Americans in the public schools, which had been occurring since the early 20th century, was unconstitutional. Some suggest that laid the basis for the better known 1954 Brown uh, uh, decision in 1954. So in terms of civil rights, Mexican Americans have given a lot, and part of that also is the contributions of the Chicano generation, which I want to move on to, uh, on to now. Uh, first of all, I mean, I think, suspect many of you know a lot of this as well, but I'm always asked an inevitable question about the term Chicano. The term Chicano is an old term. It actually is first recorded uh, in the 1920s. Uh, the uh, famous Mexican anthropologist Manuel Gamio, in his studies of Mexican immigrants, first references the term Chicano. So it appears that it came as an immigrant working class term. However, by the, into the 1940s, it is reappropriated by urban young Mexican Americans in places like East LA or South El Paso, especially those associated with the Pachucos and the Zoot Suiters of that era. And so they began to use, they rediscovered the term Chicano. And then of course in the 1960s, in the period of the Chicano movement, it is rediscovered again by a new generation. But uh, unlike the other two periods of time, in this case, the term is politicized. Uh, because to be a Chicano in the 1960s was to be an activist in the movement. That's how it was defined. So it's a, it's a term that is an old term, but it's gone through various changes over a period of time. And of course, it's still around. You know, some use it, some don't, and so forth. Although I tell my students, you know, you call yourself whatever you want. No one, no one God didn't give me the right to tell you what to call yourself. You call it whatever you want. You call yourself Chicano, you call it Latino, you call it Mexican, American. I don't care what you call yourself, as long as you're doing the right thing. And you know, then that's fine. But you know, but no, you have to you you have to define yourself. After all, part of the struggle of the Chicano movement was for people to be able to name themselves, have their own identity. So, you know, for someone to come around and say, "Well, this is what you have to call yourself," well, that's that's not part of what uh, that legacy is all about. This book, uh, which is also a study of my own generation. Chicano generation. Uh, this book is a study of the Chicano movement. And what was the Chicano movement? The Chicano movement was the largest and most expansive civil rights movement by Mexican Americans in the United States up to that time. But it also was a community empowerment movement because it was focused on empowering the communities. This generation, unlike the Mexican American generation that had also fought for civil rights, but that previous generation believed for example, in integration. It believed that uh, you know, this country could reach a point where groups that had been excluded could, could be included. Not without struggles, because they struggled, but they believed in some ways that that, that could happen. Well, it didn't completely happen, hence the Chicano movement. Uh, but the Chicano generation didn't have that focus on integration. It had a focus on community empowerment. It did not believe that this American society would ever effectively integrate Chicanos, Mexican Americans. So their focus was on empowering the community so that the communities could control their own resources, their schools, the workplace, their neighborhoods, etc., so that they would be empowered. So it had, it had a very different approach and of course a more, a more militant challenge because while the Chicano movement didn't necessarily know what could replace America, the American institutionalized society, they knew what they didn't like. They didn't like the current society that they felt was, uh, was uh, endemically uh, discriminatory towards groups like Chicanos and Mexican Americans. This generation, which is my generation, uh, was an attempt to 
continue the struggle for civil rights, but also to empower the, the communities. And it's, it's a study of three key activists in LA, in Los Angeles. And Los Angeles, in many ways, well, some have said that it, in many ways it was the capital of the Chicano movement, you know, other area communities might challenge that. But every single manifestation of the Chicano movement certainly did take place in Los Angeles, as we'll discuss. And so th this project was to study three key leaders by extensive interviews. That's how I did this book. I do a lot of oral history. I've done many oral history books, full-length oral history books, like my book on Sal Castro and the blowouts in 1968, my earlier book on Bert Corona, great Mexican-American Chicano community and labor leader. It was all based on oral histories. And, it, 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 and it's a, uh, what in Latin America is referred to as a testimonio, hence the the subtitle, Testimonials of the, Mo of the Moon. What is a testimonio? A testimonio is an oral history, usually done by an intellectual, a journalist, with an activist. Uh, and it's not that the activists might not be able to write their own stories, but in some cases, because they're activists, they'll, they'll probably never do their own stories. So it takes the intervention of someone like myself and others who have done testimonials out of Latin America, but also in this country, to get their stories down. But it's not, just, it's not just storytelling. It is storytelling. But a testimony is more than that. A testimonial is to try to get people to, in this case, read the book, uh, reflect on the book, and then even more important, act on it. What can I do? What can I do to forward the, the struggles that, that are still there that need to be uh, still carried out after having read either this book or some of the other books, for example, that, I, that I've done? What, what can I do, what can we do to continue the struggle? So um, I selected three key activists to spend uh, many hours, I would say on average maybe 30 hours per subject. And who are these activists? Well, we'll be talking about each three in the sequence that I, that I uh, introduce them in the book. One is Raul Reese, and Raul was what I call the Renaissance man of the Chicano movement. Ra Raul was active in all of the many different manifestations of the movement will mention, you know, from the, the, the walkouts in 68. Uh, he was the editor and publisher of the premier Chicano movement uh, publication of that time, uh, La Raza. He was involved in the Raza Unida Party, the Chicano Independent Party of the Chicano movement. Um, and he was involved in, in the anti-war movement and so forth. So he was, he was involved in all of these activities. Second uh, subject is Gloria Arellanes. Not well known, but has an amazing story, as I'll talk about her. Uh, she is, was, was one of, the, she was the only, from LA of course, was the only female so-called minister of the, of the Brown Berets in, L, in East LA, which was the national chapter. And Gloria has an, an amazing story, we'll talk a little bit about her story. And then the last uh, subject is uh, Rosalio Munoz. Rosalio is best known as the key organizer of the Chicano anti-Vietnam War movement. So uh, I chose them because of their importance and then of course through my interviews and so forth got much of their story down. Each of the stories, you know, begins with their childhood and what they remember about their childhood because, you know, you don't, you don't just become an activist just out of thin air. You have to have, say, any of them, it's because of their background, their family socialization. Uh, so in each case, Raul, Gloria, and Rosalio, either through their parents' encouragement to stand up for themselves, a sense of right and wrong, uh, that, uh, that influenced them. And so, uh, and then of course they become active uh, during the period of the Chicano movement. So let me uh, talk a little bit about each one of them uh, based on, on the book. We'll begin with Raul Reese. As I mentioned, Raul was involved. Uh, he, uh, he was born in El Paso, but the family moved uh, uh, when he was uh, right before high school. And so he went to high school in uh, South Central. And then he, as a student, as a, went on to college at Cal State LA. And was, he was a, when he was a student at Cal State LA, that was when Raul Reese began to become involved in the Chicano movement. And one of his first activities in the movement was in support of the 1968 so-called blowouts, walkouts in the East LA public schools. And of course this year 
in 2018, we are uh, marking uh, the 50th anniversary of the blowouts. And we're in the spring, when, when the, the, the blowouts occurred in the spring of 1968, first week of uh, March, uh, many events, uh, certainly here in California, were, were held to, to commemorate uh, the walkouts. And uh, Raul was one of the college students that supported the walkouts. Now, what were the walkouts that you're not you're less familiar with, the so-called blowouts? First of all, when I started, actually when I did my book on Sal Castro and the 68 blowouts, I had no idea where the term blowout came from. And someone said to me, you got to interview John Ortiz, one of the walkout leaders from Garfield. Blowouts, of course, were, was a strike, a student strike, by the uh, Chicano students in the East LA public schools, primarily in the high schools, although middle school students were also involved. But it was the largest high school student strike in American history. It's estimated that 20 to 30,000 students went on strike that week of March of 1968. And they were led by a very charismatic teacher by the name of Sal Castro. When I did that book, someone said, you got to talk, interview John Ortiz, one of the student leaders at Garfield. And I did, and he said, I said, John, uh, you came up with the term blowout? He said, yeah, because I was a jazz aficionado. And jazz musicians have a term that when you really emphasize a note, you say that you blew it out. And he said, that's what we were doing. We were blowing it out. And so the term blowout was used, and it, and it stuck. And so, uh, but Raul was one of the college students that assisted Sal Castro the key leader from Lincoln High School in helping to organize the students. And what were they, the protests? They were protesting years and years of discrimination against Mexican Americans in the public schools. In the early 20th century, when those mass immigrants were coming in, uh, their children started attending public schools in the barrios, in the segregated barrios. Some people have thought that, you know, one of the problems in the educational system and Mexican Americans at that this Public schools have historically ignored Mexican-Americans and Chicanos, but that's not true. The public schools were there from day one. The problem wasn't that they ignored. The problem was the nature of these schools. They were literally called Mexican schools, and they were segregated schools, and therefore inferior schools had a limited number of years that were, that were available. Uh, they were, uh, lacked resources. They... Uh, uh, were overcrowded, uh, and the worst thing was that they had teachers that had low expectations of the students. There's nothing worse. It's actually a sin. It's a social sin for a teacher to have low expectations, but that's what these kids in 68 were also facing, those same kinds of segregation, overcrowded, and low expectation for a teacher to come into a classroom and look out at his or her Chicano students and think that they cannot be challenged to perform at a high level. That's a, that's a sin. And, uh, but for years, uh, for decades, Mexican-Americans were exposed throughout the Southwest to that kind of inferior and segregated education in the so-called Mexican schools. In 68, they weren't called Mexican schools. They probably were called inner city schools by then. But they were still the legacy of the Mexican schools. That's why these kids walked out. They said, we want, these are schools that emphasized vocational as opposed to academic. Some were on the, and they had the tracking system. I mean, some were in the college, but most of them were pushed to vocational education. And the kids finally said by 68, no, we don't want that. We want to go to college. We want to, we want to be challenged and so forth. And we want to be punished for speaking Spanish that had been occurring for years and years and years, making the kids feel bad about themselves and about their Spanish-speaking uh, parents or grandparents and so forth. And so uh, they went on strike. But uh, in Raul's case, what's important that is that in addition to what the high school kids did, was that some of the college Chicanos who were already in college, USC, UCLA, Cal State LA, like in Raul's case, not many, but a few, they would, Sal encouraged them to, to help him organize the students. So uh, Raul was one of those college students that, that did that. Um, some of you probably have seen the 2006 HBO film called Walkouts, and uh, when Sal, Castro liked that film a lot, but he said what, what was ignored was the role of the college students because they were very important in helping me organize. So, so Raul was one of those uh, students. 
Joe was also involved in a little known group called Catolicos por la Raza. Uh, in LA, uh, some uh, in the Chicano movement said, you know, we're taking on the schools, we're taking on uh, businesses, we're taking on the political establishment and so forth. But uh, there's an institution in the barrios that is also important that we need to deal with, which is the institutionalized Catholic Church. Uh, and it's a, it's a powerful church, it's a rich church, and it needs to do a lot more for Chicanos in East LA and the other barrios. And so they, they began to confront the church, and, and they emphasized, hence the name Catolicos por la Raza, they were not anti-Catholic, they were Catholic. Some of them were, were, were raised Catholic like Raul. Some went to Catholic schools like Raul uh, through high school. They said, it's not the faith that we're attacking, it's the institutionalized church that is not doing enough for Chicanos and Mexican Americans. And so they, they protested uh, on, in, uh, on Christmas Eve of 1969. They had a protest in front of the newly built St. Basil's Church on Trendy Wilshire Boulevard, where the Cardinal, Cardinal McIntyre, was having his Christmas Mass. And Catolicos was there, they had an alternative Mass, and then they tried to move into the actual Christmas Mass so that they would uh, present their demands to the Cardinal for the church to do more. And also to, to, to have more, there were so very few Catholic priests uh, and so forth. And uh, so they, they had a list of demands of how the church could be more sensitive to the needs of the Chicano Mexican American population. But the Cardinal had gotten wind of the demonstration and he brought on these count, big county sheriff police to uh, serve as quote unquote ushers that evening. And so when Catolicos tried to get in, the ushers were there to pounce on them and there's fisticuffs right there in the, in the entrance to the church. It's a televised Christmas mass and you can't see the, the, what's happening, the struggle, but you can hear the sounds of it. And the Catolicos outside the church are trying to get in and they're banging on the door and they're saying, let the poor people in, let the poor people in. And Cardinal McIntyre, red-faced like a, any good Irishman can get red-faced, goes up to the podium and he denounces Catolicos and he says, he, 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 he equates them to the rabble that crucified Jesus. Uh, and so then he gets the people to try to drown out the cries of let the poor people in by singing come all, oh, well, come all ye faithful. So you have this str struggle going in between the parishioners and the Catolicos trying to get in. The Catolicos didn't last for a long time, but Raul was one of the key leaders of Catolicos por la Raza to try. And, and through their demonstrations, not only did Cardinal McIntyre later resign, but, um, but, the, but um, Cardinal Manning, who came in, uh, at least began to meet with Catolicos, and out of that came a much more sensitivity of the Catholic Church to the needs of the Chicano community. And in many ways, the roots today of the fact that the Catholic Church is one of the few established institutions in this country that, for example, supports the rights of immigrants. In some ways, it goes back to this group who challenged the church to uh, be sensitive to Chicanos, whether they were native immigrants or, or U.S. born. Raul uh, was also involved in the Chicano anti-war movement and uh, helped organize it and, uh, and publicize it through La Raza, which first began as a newspaper and then became a magazine, La Raza magazine. And in that, in that, on, that on August 29, 1970, was the National Chicano Moratorium. Chicanos had begun to protest against the war, and on August 20, 1970, a day that will live in infamy, somewhere between 20 and 30,000 mostly Chicanos protested against the war in Vietnam. They felt that the war was unjust, and it was hurting Ch the Chicano communities. They pointed out the uh, disproportionate number of Chicanos who were being drafted into the military. The only way you could escape the draft in the period of the Vietnam War is if you continue your education. But most Chicanos went to schools, as I mentioned earlier, that didn't promote education. And they also had very high dropout rates because the schools were completely insensitive to them and to their backgrounds. And so either you dropped out or you turned 18 and you graduated and Uncle Sam meets you, and bang, you're in the military. And in fact, some of these, in East LA schools, Sal Castro pointed out, there were more military recruiters than there were college recruiters. What did that tell you? And so, um, 
Chicanos began to, young Chicanos, the Chicano generation began to protest against the war. Vietnam rule was there on August 29, 1970, taking photographs. It happened to be later after the county sheriffs moved into the rally at the end of the march and broke it up, tear gas and so forth. The county sheriffs who ruled the streets of LA were not going to allow Chicanos even for one afternoon to, to run the streets of, of East LA, to have, to have control over the streets of LA. And the county sheriffs broke it up. A uh, number of people were injured. A uh, number of people were arrested. Three Chicanos killed. The most noted, Ruben Salazar, the premier Mexican-American journalist of his time for the LA Times and also was a news editor of KMEX Channel 34, the only Spanish-language television station at that time. Later, after the attack by the county sheriffs, Ruben Salazar and his TV crew went down Wilshire Boulevard, went into a cafe bar called the Silver Dollar to get away from the tear gas and all of that. Raul happened to be just across from the Silver Dollar, notices a number of like, two or three county sheriff squad cars come in and they began to position themselves. And so uh, he caught the pictures where the county sheriffs are forcing people into the, the Silver Dollar just before one of them, one of the county sheriffs will shoot at least two tear gas projectiles huge tear gas projectiles into the silver dollar at close range against the regulations of the county sheriffs. And uh, one of those uh, projectiles struck Ruben Salazar in the head and instantly killed him. And uh, his body was found out later. But Raul didn't, took, started taking these pictures. He didn't know Ruben Salazar was there. But later when the news of Ruben's death became known, he thought, well, was this where I was? And so then he processed his pictures Sure enough, this became his fa a famous picture showing the county sheriffs as they were ready to attack the silver dollar. And this is Raul uh, testifying later at a hearing as to why the county sheriffs had killed Ruben Salazar. And it, it became a joke. They did, they did not punish the county sheriffs. Nothing was done. If anything, the, the, the whole proceedings uh, was used to attack the Chicano movement itself and to the people who had organized the moratorium. Raul was also a key leader of the independent Chicano political party, La Raza Unida. Uh, this is a national convention in El Paso in 1972. He was the chair of the convention. He also ran twice in LA for the assembly uh, in East, in, from East LA. A picture of Raul. And Raul later uh, became a professor at Cal State uh, Northridge. Uh, he got his PhD from Harvard. In the, later in the 1970s, and just uh, not too long ago retired. But as I, as, as I mentioned, he was involved in so many of the activities. Gloria Arianes, as I mentioned, was the only uh, female minister of the national chapter of the Brown Berets in East LA. She, her family, she grew up in El Monte and um, uh, briefly went to community college and then uh, met uh, leaders of the Brown Berets, but David Sanchez, the Prime Minister of the Berets, and she and some of her girlfriends became interested, and they became the first contingent of females that entered into the Brown Berets uh, in, the late, in the late 60s. And uh, this is a, a picture of her with one of the guys in the Brown Berets. This was a so-called Brown Beret wedding, where one of the Brown Berets got married at the Church of the Epiphany in Lincoln Heights, and some of the Women like Gloria and some of the guys were part of the wedding uh, party. Uh, this is a picture of Gloria with her beret. Uh, what, what struck me, among other things, about her story, first of all, Gloria was very, very powerful, very articulate, very strong woman. You know, she began to speak out at beret uh, meetings and, uh, and to uh, assert herself and also to help you know, encourage the other women to become active. Yes, they did. They did encounter gender discrimination, they did encounter sexism, but Gloria and the other women stood up for themselves and uh, because they said, we're, we're brown berets, we're proud of being brown berets, and we all have to work together. But what was fascinating about her story is that it revealed that at least in the national chapter of the East LA Brown Berets, it was the women led by Gloria who did most of the work. They did most of the work. For example, they published uh, the newspaper of the Brown Berets, La Causa. Gloria was the editor, although David Sanchez ostensibly was listed as the editor, but Gloria and the women did all the work. They wrote up the stories. 
they did the illustrations, and they got the paper printed. And so it was, it's amazing. But the, the, to me, the biggest contribution of the Brown Berets in East L.A. was the work that the women led by Gloria did in establishing the, the Brown Beret Free Clinic. And uh, this is a later picture. Gloria over here to the left, uh, David Sanchez, uh, second from, 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 your, from your right. Uh, in a march after the assassination of Robert Kennedy in, uh, in 1968. But the, the Beret Free Clinic was called El Barrio Free Clinic, as you can see here on Whittier Boulevard. And this, this was led by the women uh, and they organized the doctors to volunteer, the nurses to volunteer. They were the ones who dispersed the, the medicine, who dealt with the patients who came. There was very little, there were very few uh, health facilities in East LA. And so this clinic was very important. And they serviced a large number of people over a course of about a year and a half that it, that it existed. And so uh, Gloria was, uh, was the mainstay as she was, in fact, the director of the clinic, but the women, all the women also worked. The men did not participate. They took the glory, but they didn't participate in it. And if anything, well, the services included amazing, you know, uh, uh, physical exams, uh, various kinds of uh, immunity uh, uh, injection shots, TB exams, uh, and uh, they even counseled on, um, on uh, issues of... Uh, of uh, Abortion, or they would they would uh, suggest people going to to Planned Parenthood, on birth control. Uh, they 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 assisted uh, young women and so forth. Uh, and uh, but the men uh, would often come at the end of the day to the clinic, and they would party into the evening, and mess up everything expecting Gloria and the other women to then clean it up, clean the things up afterwards. And Gloria kept telling David Sanchez, the prime minister, you, you know, this can't go on. You've got to control your guys. You've got to tell them that this cannot continue. He said, she said, if this continues, we're out. David, for whatever reason, could not do that. He couldn't control his own guys. Gloria left after a year and a half, took all the, the women, or most of the women in the Brown Berets. They left, they established a group called Pasadelitas de Aslan, which became involved, especially in the Chicano anti-war movement. Then she later established her own clinic, also in East LA for, for a short period of time. And then um, she was involved in the, in the protest against the war, and she, but she was so affected by what happened on August 20, 1970, the attack by the county sheriffs, that for a while she just kind of uh, couldn't become active much longer. But then she later rediscovered her indigenous roots on her mother's side, and she then for many, many years, and even now, is very much involved in her indigenous community in the L.A. area. This is a more current uh, shot of uh, Gloria with Rosalio Munoz. It's in segues into the last section, the section on Rosalio Munoz. Rosalio, who uh, grew up in... Uh, in L.A. And, and, Link, and Lincoln Heights in East L.A., and then the family moved to Highland Park, uh, and that's where he graduated from high school. Um, he actually was elected in his high school, which was a mixed high school, as president of his, of his senior class, and then went on to UCLA. He had an elder brother who had already been to L.A., and college was part of their family culture. His father was act had gotten a Ph.D. in education in the 1950s, and so he, Rosalio had you know, knew that he was going to go to college, so he goes to UCLA, and he will have the distinction in his senior year of being elected the uh, president of the uh, UCLA student body. Not of Mecha, of the student body. So he becomes the first Mexican-American Latino ever elected a student, student body president of UCLA. And he becomes then become active on campus. He had already been active on campus. But he begins to act uh, with the Mecha group in student politics and so forth. And, um, and also he becomes quite concerned about uh, what has happened in Vietnam and about his draft so that when he graduates, you know, he is uh, eligible to be drafted and he does get his, his draft uh, notification. But by then, he feels that uh, 
He cannot support the war in Vietnam for what it's doing to the Chicano community, as I mentioned. And so he decides to uh, resist a draft and to not accept, being, accept his induction, induction. But he wants to make it to go public on this. He wanted to do something like the great heavyweight champion Muhammad Ali did when in 1966, I believe, he was also drafted and he refused his induction and went public. And Muhammad Ali said, I'm not going to go fight this war in Vietnam. What have the Vietnamese ever done to me? I don't even know any Vietnamese. What have they done to me? But, I, but he said, you know where I'll fight? I'll fight in my home state of Kentucky where those white racists have harmed me and my family. I'll go to war there. Where am I going to go to Vietnam? Vietnamese have never hurt me and my family. Rosalia wanted to do the same kind of public, public declaration against why he uh, did not, would refuse his induction. So this is on, the, on, on September 16th of 1969. Obviously, he selected September. Actually, he didn't select. His draft, his, no, his, his induction was scheduled for September 16th, the 16th of September in 1970. And so this is Rosalio outside of the induction center. Whether planned or not, he used that day to protest uh, the war and, and the draft especially and why he would not be drafted. And uh, in, a, in a declaration called I Accuse, he accused, among other things, the, uh, America, the U.S. government of genocide, uh, of genocide against Chicanos in the war in Vietnam because of the disproportionate drafting of Chicanos in the war and the disproportionate casualties of Chicanos in the war. He said this is, this is a version of genocide in his I accuse statement. Uh, and so he goes public. He first helps to organize anti-draft uh, resistance by Chicanos in a movement called Chale con el Draft, or the hell with the draft. Uh, and so, but Ro Rosalio quickly will realize that the best way to deal with the draft is to end the war. And so he then shifts to begin to organize against the war in Vietnam. And so through press conferences, but in terms of basic organizing, going to conferences and meeting with people and so forth, um, the decision is made to hold a national moratorium, moratorium meaning to seize, to stop the war. And the decision is made by Chicanos in, throughout the Southwest that there will be a national moratorium protest against the war in East Los Angeles on August 29, 1970. And it's Rosalio who becomes the head of the moratorium, National Moratorium Committee to organize. There, were already, there already had been protests against the war that Rosalio had been involved in in East LA, and protests against the war in many other parts of the Southwest. But this was now going to be the protest, a national protest, where Chicanos throughout the Southwest would come to protest the war in Vietnam. And, uh, so, uh, and so they did. And Rosalio worked very, very hard uh, organizing. You can imagine they expected a large group. Not as many as the 20 to 30,000 eventually came, but they had to provide you know, for people to stay, you know, uh, lodging and food and just planning the logistics. They met many times with the county sheriffs at, at the area that the, the march and the demonstration to, and to, uh, to emphasize that this would be a nonviolent march and that there would be families in the park and so forth, as indeed there were, and children and so forth. And so they did a lot of work for a number of months prior to August 29, 1970. This is Rosalio at one of the earlier protests against the war in Vietnam in February uh, of 19, uh, 1970 uh, in what was called the March in the Rain because of a heavy rainfall that particular Saturday uh, in February of 1970. This uh, other protest uh, against the war, but also he was involved in some of the protests against the, in the schools as well. Uh, marching, again, Charlie uh, Conal draft, against the draft and against the war. And this is Rosalio at the end of the march uh, in East LA, and uh, after there's been you know, some musical uh, dances and so forth, Rosalio was introduced to the speakers and so forth, so he gave the first presentation, the first speech. Uh, at the end of the speech, or toward the end of the speech, he noticed that there seemed to be some, something going on toward the back of the park. And there were families there, there were children, there were all the protesters that had marched into um, the 
park that's now called Ruben Salazar Park. And he noticed that something was happening. And so pretty soon what was happening was the county sheriffs moving in. The county sheriffs claimed that some Chicanos at the end of the march had gone into a liquor store, had taken some liquor without paying it, and so that's why the cops were there. But as I tell my student, okay, maybe that did happen, although that was never proven. But it did take an army of county sheriffs, an army, literally an army of county sheriffs to deal with that incident. You know, they were there, they were there in numbers, and it's possible that they used or even trumped up that incident to justify. They declared the rally uh, to uh, now be uh, you know, unlawful. And, uh, and they moved it in force with their, with their billy clubs, with their tear gas projectiles, shooting tear gas into the crowd and so forth, and literally destroyed um, the, uh, the rally itself. This is Rosalio later the next day at a news conference protesting the actions of the, of the county sheriffs. Uh, one year later, or in 71, yeah, there was a follow-up to what was called La Marcha de la Reconquista, uh, with the berets, David Sanchez over here to the left, Rosalio Munoz is over behind the, the sign that says La Marcha de Reconquista. They marched from Calexico on the U.S.-Mexico border to Sacramento uh, during the summer of 1971, to, not only to continue to protest against the war, but on many, many other Chicano movement issues, support for the farm workers, to uh, end with the, uh, the conditions in the schools, etc. There's a later picture of Rosalio with uh, Raul Ruiz, at one of the reunions of, uh, of, the, of the Chicano movement. But Rosalia was the key uh, leader of, uh, of the anti-war movement. And so all three uh, really represent uh, key leadership and the activists of the movement and what the movement was all about in terms of trying to bring about social change uh, and social justice and, uh, and what they went through in, in doing so and the courage that it took. And, to me, what's, also, what's important is knowing that we've had leaders like this, that we've had movements like this, especially in this very dangerous time where the, the very fate of American democracy may be uh, you know, uh, occurring, uh, that it's important that people know that people have protested uh, in support of uh, their rights uh, and their liberties and how those struggles uh, need to continue and how we can be empowered by knowing about uh, stories of uh, like Raul and Gloria and, and Rosalio, who had, uh, again, the courage to stand up and to say, no, we, we don't want this kind of America. We want something that's different. And to stand up and say, no, Chicanos and Latinos are very much a part of American history. They've given a lot to this history. They have fought in all of America's wars. In World War II alone, a lot of people don't realize that maybe half a million Latinos were in World War II, um, most of them Mexican-Americans and Puerto Ricans. And that they, in that war, uh, many of them never came back. They got the largest number per capita of Congressional Medal of Honor, the highest award for valor. Uh, so Chicanos and Latinos have been very much a part of this country, fighting for the rights, for their rights, but also the rights of all, all other Americans. And those, so those struggles have to continue. So I'll stop here and entertain any particular questions you may have. I know I went kind of... Well, there's so much to these stories, and I, I can't give them complete justice, so, uh, but all of that's in, in their stories in the book itself, so you can get more details about that. So thank you very much, and let's sum it up to your uh, discussion or questions or comments. Yes. You, um, in your introduction to the, uh, your presentation, you mentioned about the Chicanos not looking favorably upon the Mexican American generation. Okay. You know, I, um, I think the greatest thing that came out of the Chicano movement was us kicking those doors down and opening up colleges and universities. And there are now so much literature that is coming out. So when you came out with your book, The Mexican American, uh, it, it's not type of generation, but Mexican American, um, that was such an awakening for me to read that book and, and to realize for the first time how involved the veterans, the LULACers, the GI Forum, all the, all, the, all the political legislation, all the lawsuits that, that they instigated. So if, if we were to say that my generation kind of looked down, it's because we didn't know. 
You know, we didn't know what, what these people actually had done. Uh, okay, so that was one. But other concern is, how come there's not, um, other than La Marcha de la Reconquista, there's, there's, I don't think there's anything on David Sanchez. I'm just wondering why. Well, let me, no, I mean, I know he, it, no one has really, no one has written his biography. That could be, that should be done. And of course, David has written his own kind of semi-autobiography um, some years ago. What's the name of that book? Uh, yeah, yeah. So he 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 written kind of his um, semi autobiography, which is uh, important. But a full story of David uh, would be needed. And again, you know, in, in the section on glory, of course, David appears obviously. But uh, from her perspective, I mean, a lot of the problems with the guys, I mean, in terms of not really uh, supporting as much as they should of the women and allowing the women to. I mean, the women, as I mentioned, did all the work. The guys took the glory you know, to the point where Gloria said, no, we can't, we're not going to deal with that anymore. But to your first point about, uh, uh, yeah, the, the Chicano generation, my generation, we knew very little of the previous political generation, uh, earlier leadership from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And not knowing that, a lot of Chicano movement activists felt that that previous generation had not done very much. And because they saw contemporary LULAC, for example, League of United Latin American Citizens, the oldest Mexican-American civil rights organization established in the late 1920s, uh, and which had become a, a bit uh, less active into the period of the Chicano movement, they tried to interpret a group like LULAC and read, and read a certain history into LULAC of that period, but that, that that was, that was a mistake because uh, LULAC, going back to the 30s and 40s, was quite active in terms of taking on discrimination in the schools, in restaurants, and other public facilities, and so forth, promoting leadership. And, but the Chicano generation didn't know much about the previous Mexican-American generation. And, and of course, by doing my book on the Mexican-American generation, you know, of course, I discovered that as well, but discovered how an activist generation. And it wasn't just so-called those of the middle class. There were radicals who were also involved, labor organizers like Bert Corona and so forth. So it was not so that some were middle class or lower middle class like those in LULAC. And, and then there were the veterans and the American GI Forum. In L.A., there was a so-called Spanish-speaking Congress led by tremendous female leader, Josefina Fierro, uh, who was uh, more militant, more radical, uh, and uh, intellectuals at that time, like George Sanchez, and so forth. I mean, it was a very activist generation. And in a way, they kind of set the stage for the Chicano movement. They didn't, weren't able to achieve all that they wanted in terms of uh, achieving full rights. So in a way, the Chicano movement and generation steps into that void. There was this kind of disconnect, and partly it was just ignorance, but it didn't know about this earlier history. But, you know, but the Chicano movement achieved what the Mexican-American generational movement did not. And what was that? It, it, because of its it was more widespread, it was more militant, it was more challenging, it helped to begin to open up doors that had not been opened up. Higher education, for in fact, you, one, in many ways, the, the biggest achievement by the Chicano movement was getting access into higher education, when you think about it. And look back over 50 years and so forth since the walkouts, how many thousands upon thousands of young Chicanos and Latinos have now gone on to higher, to higher education, BAs, MAs, PhDs, like myself, and so forth. I wouldn't have been able to go to higher education had it not been for the Chicano movement. The Chicano movement created Chicano studies, of which I teach in that department of Chicano Studies at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, but opening up uh, access to, in the other professions, in politics, in business, in the media, that had never happened before. And that's what the Chicano movement did. And it, yeah, many, and, and, it, and the Chicano movement made Chicanos and by extension other Latinos for the first time into national political actors. It's, the Chicano movement laid the basis for contemporary 
which is real, Latino political power. That's the origins of it. And I tell my students, we need to understand that because there's a legacy there. There's a legacy there. But each of you has to answer, well, how am I going to respond to that legacy? Uh, but, but it's in part by making sure that the struggles continue because obviously the Chicano movement did not achieve necessarily everything. And there's still a lot of injustices that affect this country, including minority groups like Chicanos and other Latinos. So, we can see that today on the issues of immigration and the uh, demonization of immigrants and what is happening along the border, and what happened recently in tearing away the children from the immigrants who were coming. There's still a, all these challenges and even more challenges because we are in, a, in an unprecedented period where the very nature of American democracy and American liberties is clearly uh, at risk today. And, uh, and this is a time for people to band together again, as the, as the Chicano movement did, because that's what it's going to take. It's going to take struggle, it's going to take organization, it's going to take confrontation. Uh, but that's how people have always achieved uh, democratic rights and liberty rights. They're, they, they're, not, they're not given, they're, they're taken. How, how was slavery ended? By abolitionists struggling. So how did women get the right to vote in 1920? Women, organizing to vote? How did working people get the right to unionization in the 1930s by organizing to labor unions, and later with Caesar and Dolores and the farm worker struggle, uh, and, uh, and so forth and so on. So that, 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 that needs to continue. And, uh, but we need to know that we've had this kind of a history. Because if we don't know that Chicanos Latinos have had this history, you think, well, what can we do? Nothing can be done. But no, look at the past. The past tells us already what needs to be done, literally what needs to be done. And that is to organize, to struggle, and to, and to have the courage to, to take on these institutions and other leaders and so forth who are trying to take away democratic rights from, from us and from other Americans. Other questions, comments? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm originally from East LA. I've been up here for about, uh, about a year and a half. The stories you tell, even right now over there, it's it's tough. It's very tough going against the system itself. They put us down left and right, but we're always coming coming up, working at it, bringing new youngsters, trying to uh, like you, uh, trying to uh, school them so they don't know the rich history. We do have a rich history, but it's not out there. We don't exist. No, oh, I mean it's it's so important, you know. It's frustrating, too. At the university level, and I've been part of it, you know, they mentioned 20 books and so forth, and a lot of other um, scholars in Chicano studies, Latino studies, have researched over the last 50 years so much, have published so much. We, we now know so much more about the Chicano Latino experience than we knew 50 years ago. The problem is that it has been too much uh, isolated at the university college level, it has not seeped down. It's not seeped down to the K to 12. And that's where it needs to go. That's where the kids need to know about their, that rich history, especially in school districts now, here, like here in California. And many school districts up and down the state, you know it better than I do, are overwhelmingly Chicano Latino. At least LA, LA, the LA school district, the second largest school district outside of New York City in the country is 70, 80% Latino. They need to know about this. I get kids that come to me from the schools that walked out in 68. They don't even know that those walkouts occurred. They don't know. They don't know who Sal Castro was. Uh, and, and so they, they need to know that to empower them, to make them feel good about themselves, to know, yeah, we have a rich history and we have a rich history American history, they need to know that they are American history. Yeah. So, so if they don't know that, then they're, they're, they think that Chicanos and Latinos have done nothing in American history. They haven't been part of American history. And yet, you know, in, in, the, in the hour or lesson that I've talked to you, I've mentioned a lot of things that Chicanos and Latinos have done and much more. 
but it has to go down to the K to 12. And I don't understand why, because because of the, the openings that the movement developed, we now have a lot of Chicano Latino teachers in these school districts. We have principals, we have vice principals, we have people on school boards. In some cases, they're, they're the majority in the school board. And I don't know where their heads are. Why isn't all of this material not seeping down and they're integrating? It's not just history, but the literature. We have wonderful writers and poets and artists. You can see this here in this exhibit. Why isn't this being shown and displayed so that the kids know about this? It will encourage... Sal Castro used to say, if a kid, if a, if a student doesn't feel good about themselves, and he said this is basic psychology 101, if they don't feel good about themselves, they're not going to succeed. They're not going to succeed. They need to be feel that they're good, that, that, that they, they come from a rich history, and, and that um, to make them feel good about themselves. But, but that's, 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 I think, is the next big, I mean, that's a big challenge. We've got to get this down. I'll, I always tell this little anecdote. Just to illustrate it once again, when Caesar died, Caesar Chavez died in 1993, um, one of my colleagues in Chicano Studies announced it to his class. He said, well, he said what a great tragedy that Caesar died. And one of the students, this is a Chicano Studies class, said, yeah, what a great tragedy. He was such a great boxer. He was talking about Julio Cesar Chavez, who was a great boxer, but not the Cesar Chavez. This is in a Chicano Studies class. I mean, and so they don't even know, some of them don't even, of course, admittedly, this is 1993, some years ago. But I suspect I still get a lot of students who don't know who Cesar Chavez was, who Dolores was. When I teach my Chicano Studies classes, and I teach a very large intro class of 500 students, I take nothing for granted that they know uh, much of, of what I'm going to teach. So, uh, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's a big challenge. I mean, that's, it has to seep down. Other questions? I, mean, it, it, I just wanted to highlight on that. that Did you have a question back there? No? Okay. You have a follow-up question? No, I, you know, it, it, is a, it, it is a big challenge to, to get that um, in, uh, in Stockton. I was telling you, we, we drove up from Stockton. And uh, we opened a, a Chicano Research Center, probably the only kind in, in the country with, we have filing cabinets of La Causa newspaper, we have La Raza magazine from Raul, we have uh, Gonzafos, we have uh, all the stuff that was, because I was there, so I saved it. But we're dying to get people to come in and look at it. You know, we've advertised in the district, we put things in the newspaper, we, you know, it, it's, it's like there's somewhere else, even the teachers. You know, Stockton Unified is like 70% Rasa students. And, and there's a lot of uh, Rasa um, administrators and teachers, like you were saying, about LA. And it's like, where are they? <laughs> where are they? In the 70s, we were fighting for Rasa studies and to get in there. Now they're, it looks like they're just fighting for their credential and forget the Rasa part of it. So hopefully with ethnic studies now, um, there'll be a change. Yes, hopefully that is, because part of it is that, I mean, in the high schools, for example, you have ethnic studies, but for the most part, it's been uh, their electives. And so um, as electives, that means that the students, you know, especially if they're uh, in a track to go on to college and so forth, I mean, they don't have time to take an elective. They've got so many requirements, like if they want to go to the UC system, for example, they have to, they have to deal with all those requirements. So, uh, I mean, I spoke a couple of years ago at one of our local high schools in the Santa Barbara area, and they had a, to a Chicano Studies class. Well, yeah, they had about maybe 25 students. That's great, but there's, this, is a, this is a high school of several hundred, and many of them are Chicano Latinos, you know. But uh, So it's important to, as the movement is now, to institutionalize ethnic studies so that all the students in our high schools, I, hope, I wish it were K-12, to have to take, you know, ethnic studies uh, classes. One last thing about, I mean, this was a, this was a work of love in, in having to interview um, these three um, activists, uh, you know, getting to know them. It was a long, long project, a lot of ups and downs in it, but um, finally we were able to bring it all together in, in the book. And um, so it's, uh, there. what I like doing these kind of oral st history stories is that, uh, and testimonies that, that they're written in, 
in the first person. They're written in, in the words, in the voice of the, in this case, of these three participants, these three these activists. It's in their, I mean, I write it, but, but it, it, it comes out in their voice. And so it, they're autobiographies. So they're very readable. And going back to how, well, how can we integrate, I mean, a book like this could easily be used in the high schools. It's very readable. There are three autobiographies in one book. And so uh, wonderful stories, encouraging stories, empowering stories. But we've got to get the teachers, we've got to get the uh, principals, we've got to get the school boards to say, yeah, we've got to now make sure that some of this material is being produced. Some of them which they would say, I actually took in college. Well, okay, you took it in college, but now you've got to integrate it in your high schools, in your middle schools, for example. And uh, because, um, uh, you know, they're, they're accessible. It's not, you know, theoretical things, but it's, uh, it's very uh, direct. Yes, sir. I have a question about your uh, interview process. You said you spent about 30 hours with each of the subjects, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering uh, how did it roll out, like an hour of, two hours at a time, or over weeks, over months, over days, or uh, uh, All of the above, you know. I mean, I, I spent, uh, you know, no, I have fond memories of going down. I first interviewed Raul Reese, fond memories of going. In some cases, uh, every week or every other week, we would interview three, maybe four hours, you know, uh, depending on how much time he had. Uh, also, going down to interview Rosalio in his home, and then and Gloria, uh, also in her home in El Monte, which is her family house, where she still lives. But all those cats, I remember all those cats in her house and all of that. But, um, but wonderful experiences, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give up, you know. And then, uh, so it, it took time because, you know, there was a logistics of my having to go down to LA and do the personal interviews. I've done a lot of interviews of oral histories, like this recent book that's coming out out actually physically in August this month, and then it'll be officially out in October. It's a biography, not, not a testimonial, but a biography of Father Luis Olivares of Los Angeles, who was the key leader of the sanctuary movement in the 1980s when the Central American refugees started to come in. And he was the pastor of La Placita Church there in downtown LA, right across from Monbetta Street. And he's the one who welcomed them in, hosted them, housed them, literally many of the men uh, he, would he would house them in the church itself and did many other services for them. But uh, it's a remarkable story, but it's this whole story of, of giving. And, um, but, um, but for that biography, I did over 90 interviews. But I did a lot of them on, on the phone because, I mean, think about it. Trying to go down to L.A. to do all of those, not actually 93 interviews would have been so time-consuming. So... I did a lot of phone interviews, which were just as effective, but for this book, I, I needed to be with them, you know, the, the personal contact, and um, they were great experiences, but it took a period of time to do it. Yes. Um, can you talk about maybe some of the current issues facing the Latino or Chicano community in Los Angeles, whether gentrification or maybe past experience from development of Dodger Stadium may have kind of you know, informed that community and moving forward, how will they address gen gentrification? Well, that, that, that happens in all of the communities and certainly has happened historically in the uh, Chicano community of L.A. that you're speaking of where Chavez Ravine was a barrio, was a Mexican-American barrio, and when the Dodgers relocated from Brooklyn in the late uh, 50s, they got access to that property by the city but in order to build Dodger Stadium, they had to move the people out. And that was a very uh, tense moment. And uh, people lost their homes, of course, and had to be relocated. But, um, yeah, I tell my students, next time you go to Dodger Stadium, you know, uh, and you're eating that Dodger dog, remember that this used to be a Chicano Barrio, right there where second base was, where the whole, where the whole stadium is. Well, that's an issue, and it still remains. There's a lot of pressures in a lot of these communities, including East L.A. now, is... There's gentrification going on or attempts at gentrification. But a lot of these issues that the movement fought on, whether it's education uh, or uh, political representation. And of course, immigration was an issue for the Chicano movement as well, you know, because this, into the 60s and 70s, there's a lot of alarm in this country over undocumented immig immigration. And there's efforts to try to deport and 
you know, thousands of who indeed were being deported in the 1970s and so forth. And so that becomes a Chicano movement issue. So a lot of these issues remain. A movement was enabled to, of course, uh, uh, bring justice to all of these issues. And so the succeeding generations, whether we call them Latino generation, whatever, these issues are being passed on. But people continue to struggle, as they've always done. Look at the level of organization going on even today uh, in protection of the immigrants and how the immigrants themselves are organizing. Look at the... Uh, the um, you know, the young people uh, who have, are organizing themselves to, to protect themselves, the dreamers, to protect themselves as well. So, so that's happening, it's there, and, and it has to happen because, you know, in the end, no one's going to do it for you. You know, you have to, you have to organize amongst yourself, and, uh, and that's important. But it's also uh, important to know that others have attempted, have been in these struggles in the past, and that... Uh, concept of struggling for your rights is very much a part of your legacy. important in, in the Chicano movement. It, it was part of what was called the Chicano Renaissance because the movement brings forth a flowering of literature and the arts uh, and poetry, murals, mural uh, construction and so forth. It was called the Chicano Renaissance and um, uh, many artists were involved in it and they were inspired by the movement were inspired by the movement and they became movement artists and they placed their art in support of the movement. Um, they uh, never bought into the idea that somehow art and politics are separate. Art is always political, even the most abstract art is political because it speaks to its historical period. Therefore, it, it passes on a certain politics. But the movement uh, artists were very cognizant of how they were artists in, in support of the movement. They were movement artists. And the murals uh, that began to appear from East LA to San Francisco to many, many other places were part of this artistic uh, renaissance. And um, they, of course, were borrowing from, they rediscovered, a lot of these young artists rediscovered the mural movement that came out of the Mexican Revolution of 1910, Diego Rivera, and, uh, Siqueiros, uh, and so forth. And they began to uh, attempt to do the same thing, to bring art to the people, because that's what, as you know, what, that's what mural art is, is to take it out of the museums where the people don't necessarily go, but bring it into the public, put it, put it on the walls, in the radios, and so forth. And, and many of them did that, and so it became public art. And um, so there are many, many artists that were involved in that, and collectives like uh, Royal Chicano Air Force in Sacramento and many other collectives that spring up all throughout the Southwest and even into the Midwest where there's this significant mural movement going on. And, uh, and there have been, you know, there's been research and publications. Some, some of the books that are here speak to that artistic movement uh, then and even later. So there is a history to it and it is being recorded. And of course, a lot of these Images are, uh, sometimes some of the murals still exist in some places. Um, 
but um, the images uh, that were recorded and photographs and so forth, they are available in different libraries and archives. At UC Santa Barbara, where I teach in our special collections, we have a very, very large collection of Chicano movement art images. Um, and so they are being preserved. And it's important to know about them because uh, they are not only a contribution to American art, but also they reflect a very important political period, uh, specifically in the case of the Chicano movement. We have the collection, we have Luis Valdez, we have many other artists and writers um, that uh, we've been able to secure for, for our special collection. But UCLA has a whole number too. I'm sure some of the libraries and archives up here also have some of these collections. Again, these are interesting because, again, going back to our earlier discussion of the K-12, to why can't these images be shown effectively to the kids, you know, in art classes, in the high schools, like, to see what Chicanos and Latinos have produced? Yes, it's important for them to look at other artists from other backgrounds, you know, the great masters and so on. But what about, you know, Chicano Latino artists over time, especially those that came out of the movement, the tremendous, uh, you know, images? And uh, artists like Judy Baca, who just her biography of Judy, actually her autobiography is just out from the University of Minnesota Press, but Judy did tremendous art in LA. She did that uh, so-called Great Wall there in the San Fernando Valley that spans miles uh, that was done uh, later in the, um, in the 80s where she got students and others uh, to, do, to, to help her put these images together. It's kind of a counter history of Los Angeles, a minority view of LA history, including a Chicano Latino view of LA history. All of that's there. We just need to you know, access it. Over there, and then maybe a brief comment. Go ahead. OK. I, I, all right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Garcia, you're a prolific author, you've written over 20 books. So I'm just curious if you wouldn't mind sharing your personal habits around writing. Do you write just after some chorizo huevos, after tamales? Do you write in the morning? Do you write at night? Do you get up in the middle of the night with an idea and start writing? How do you get all this done? Because no, it's just, it's just, well, first of all, it's just a dedication, a commitment, a love for what I do, and, um, and then being consistent. You know, I, I have a saying, a saying to myself, you know, even if I only work an hour one day, well, it advances whatever the project is, you know? And um, but so you have to be consistent. You can't think, well, you know, I'll wait till the summer and that's when I, no, you're not gonna do it. It has to be consistent, but you also have to be dedicated and committed because there's still, for me, there's still so much Chicano history that needs to be done and I'm not sure who's gonna do it. So I said, well, I'll do it. You know, I'll take on, I'll take on that work as much as I can, you know? Like, I, I did an edited volume of Dolores Huerta, but, but I've never attempted a full biography of Dolores. That would be a big, big project, and I've had so many other projects already at hand. But whoever, I've always maintained, whoever does that big biography of Dolores Huerta can write themselves into their own history. I mean, they will just, you know, skyrocket into fame for doing that big biography of Dolores Huerta, which is just crying to be done. But there's so many others whose stories need to be told. I can't tell them all. I've tried to tell many. But... Um, but uh, yeah, in a way, I'm kind of driven to make to get these stories done. It's kind of my commitment. But it has to be consistent. None of these books were done just by working over the summer. <laughs> no, I get up early. I get up early, as my wife will attest. I get up early. I'm an early riser, and sometimes I go right in and start doing some of the work I'm doing. But I can work during the day, and then sometimes even I'll work into the evening. You know, it depends. It depends if there isn't a game that I need to watch on television, a Laker game or. <laughs> Did you have any quick comment? Can I put my two cents on uh, Judy Baca? I know her, and uh, if it wasn't for her, the murals in LA and the biggest mural in San Fernando Valley here, uh, she gets students from the universities and colleges to help her, and uh, kids from the neighborhood who wants to help uh, redo those murals. And uh, those murals are redone every so many years, yeah. and they're still up there. And that's, those murals, I guess you could say it's, a, it's like a history. 
No, oh, absolutely, absolutely. I tell the history, absolutely. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you so much and uh, for your attention and your questions, your comments, and so forth. And I understand we'll have a book signing for those of you who want to get a copy of the Chicago Generation book. And so I'll, I'll be sitting over here to sign books. So. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, thank you again so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.